So this is an interview of Mario Lanzarote of All and Sundry put on by Basepoken4 at the Brooklyn Shoe Space. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, my name is Sheena. I am the founder of The Spoken For, an online publication mm -hmm. that connects, inspires, bespoke footwear, and leather clothing, as well as us. And welcome to Brooklyn Shoe Space, this amazing co working footwear space. I'd like to welcome our guest, Mario Lanzarati from All and Sundry. He went on uh, to find a couple of shoe makers here in the city and they uh, asked for prices uh, around $1,500, $2,000 and upwards. And uh, you guys know better than I do uh, how expensive it is to actually make a shoe and what goes into shoemaking. So he couldn't find anyone here, so he started traveling. He went to Mexico, he went to China, India, and uh, actually the idea was just to get a pair of shoes made for him. So he stumbled upon a couple of shoemakers in China, and um, then they started making shoes for him, just two, three pairs. But he then started playing with the idea of actually starting his own brand. And uh, out of that idea, Al Bol and Sunri was born. I know exactly that Chinese manufacturers are able to deliver high quality shoes, provided that you, that you guide them along the way. So what made you, or not you specifically, or Nick, or the company, choose China? Like, was it just because he was able to find, you know, a, a great craftsman that met his needs at a price point that he could afford, um, and was able to make that one pair for him? Or was it, like, what really prompted China, like, as opposed to any other country? There's a lot more countries we, we have not tried, but yeah. personally, so, so, when I came on board, I still ha I had the idea of venturing into Italy because I am from Italy, so I know I have a network there, I know people, and I did call the, pe the people up and I said, hey, would you guys be willing to work with us? And like, this is our website. And all of them, they were like, oh, this is amazing, you guys did a fantastic job, but yeah, there's no way we're going to do that because ultimately we have a sample manufacturer. Every single pair of shoes is made to order, so we don't have any inventory. So the, the shoes you order online, even if you were to go online and order this exact pair, we would have to make it the, the way it is, but then customize it to the measurements of the client. So that really is very difficult because manufacturers, they just think in numbers. They don't have the, the mindset to see the, the actual value, what you have here, the idea. They just want to have, uh, they want to have this loafer and make it a thousand times. Then right. they'll start working with you. And uh, there were a couple guys who said, yes, okay, that idea sounds good, but we are looking at a cost of $300 mm -hmm. plus shipping. So you'd, be a, you'd probably look at $350. And then if you think that at some point you also have remakes, like that's going to yeah. kill you, destroy your business model. One of the things we first we, we started out with were, was the price point at $350. And we noticed uh, we then changed to $495, and it was the best decision we ever made because it allowed us to work with uh, retail partners, it allowed us to also, to, I would say, upgrade the brand, the, the well-deserved upgrade, because we had that perception, oh, this is so expensive, people will never buy it, they're not gonna spend 500 bucks for a pair of shoes, but they actually are. They see that there's a need there, and they see the quality, and Nick, so my partner, has tried to, to start it up in Mexico, same answer no chance, we're not going to make it for you guys. And we've even talked to manufacturers over here. And that's ultimately still the goal for us to come over here. But unfortunately, the level of skill is not here yet. Uh, maybe we haven't found it yet. And it's interesting because I feel like just to hear, you know, that the, the U.S. as a whole struggles in terms of the scale of the craftsmanship. Like, I, especially being in, in, a, in a space like this with all of these talented people, I really feel like there's so much opportunity and that Absolutely. with with the right um, training, with the right leadership, with the right, you know, craftsman or artisan or somebody that has had tons of experience and a shoemaker all advice, fifth, fourth, fifth year generation, whatever, that can come and actually train, you know, yeah. and really give people the kinds of skills that they really need. I think that um, the U.S. is going to be huge. It could be a really huge Absolutely. opportunity, especially because your model is based on taking craftsmen that already 
do what they do. They're already took, they're living their lives, they have their brands, they're doing whatever, but they still need some sort of stability. Yeah. And to be able to work as a team of six together to create all of these goods, you know, they still have the opportunity to create their own lines and do their own things, but to work as a team under one project and to be able to have that stability, I think that's an amazing opportunity for makers and could be potentially really huge to do here. Bespoke and custom goods, footwear, leather goods, furniture, cars, the whole nine. The lifestyle is going to become much more prominent and, and much more talked about and big as an industry. And I feel like there is such a huge opportunity for makers, but they're so like, this stitch isn't right. <laughs> and they're so, they're honed in, they're honed in on the creative, the creative process that when it comes time for, you know, their big to do or, you know, the spotlights on them, they may not be ready or to, to make 100 pairs, yeah. 150 pairs, 200 pairs. How do you suggest creating some sort of scalable program while still allowing makers to maintain the bespoke and the custom um, programs that they they love? That's what they that's what they do. So, how what are your suggestions in terms of like giving them opportunities to scale? So, I would definitely not uh, sacrifice uh, volume or sacrifice quality for volume. Because that's ultimately what your your brand, your business is about, and people should always recognize you for what it is. Um, but as you said, there's a there's such a huge trend to to move from fast fashion, from major brands to to custom or bespoke. Because people, we all individuals, and hopefully we start realizing that more and more and more, and we start expressing that through individual fashion right. and custom bespoke items. I think for you guys as well. I mean. You can benefit from a ready-to-wear collection, but still have bespoke um, and the, the actual craft of making the shoes as your front liner. Make sure that you, you, have, you don't have too many options. Um, and then keep that bespoke, but allow yourself to also go for ready-to-wear and even make it with, on a machine. Because ultimately, that's the only way you're going to scale. It's the same with us. I mean, we're eventually gonna, gonna offer a ready-to-wear line, which is gonna allow us to increase the volume, which in return will bring down the cost, which we then can pass on to the consumer, and which will allow us to grow as a brand. So I think there is definitely uh, an opportunity for individual craftsmen to combine their styles and then come up with maybe something completely new, like a ready-to-wear line which has never been seen before, something which carries the, the, the spirit of Brooklyn, the spirit of New York, but it still is affordable because when people hear bespoke, they're like, "Oh my God, this is like this is an act, another level. I could never afford this in my life." You have to educate them. You have to tell them every single step that goes into making a shoe. And most people don't know the difference between custom and bespoke. And custom uh, is not where bespoke is. So bespoke, what you guys do, is a whole another level. Um, it takes a lot more time and a lot more uh, energy that goes into it. And it's much more expensive. So. We then spoke to our craftsmen and said, hey, is there a way for us to, to work with these guys? Because we really want to make them happy. So they said, yes, there is a way for us to offer bespoke. And the way it works is we, let's say you're a size 16, you're a very big guy, and, but you have a sneaker that fits you well. So we take that sneaker, we take your measurements, we ship everything to our guys in China. They have a last uh, manufacturer they work with. Then they create a last and we shape it the way the customer wants it and then you can do whatever. There's really no limit. I think where the fun really starts, and that's also for us, and gets me really excited, is when you get a 3D model of your foot, but then you print out the last. So, and you guys know how long it takes to make a last, and how expensive it is, and the kind of effort that goes into it. Now imagine you could scan your foot with a, with a, with a smartphone, and then you print out the last. And then you do that in, in a matter of hours. So we would have someone scan their foot over here, our guys in China print out the last, and then they create a bespoke shoe. And they can do anything. It's not like you go into the store and you buy a pair of Nikes. 
it's not you're not highly involved. You're not gonna go on social media. Oh my God, Nike made this perfectly for me. This is awesome. <laughs> Maybe some people, but most of them will not. So whereas this, you're gonna talk about it all day because you want people to look at this and say, Oh, by the way, I have my own monogram. <laughs> right? I have my own monogram. And they say, Oh, who made this? Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. These really great guys. They went above and beyond for me. They made this. I said, Oh, I, I want to know that. And that's how you build it up. And then at some point you involve other brands. Whenever I have clients asking me for a bargain, oh, and, and usually these are the guys, the, rich, the richest guys in the city are the worst to work with. Because these comments, they're like multi-millionaire CEOs who have done their own business. like, oh, this is awesome. Like, so yeah, how much do you want? So yeah, four ninety-five. dollars Here's 300 no, it's like you, you could buy my business, so pay me five hundred. I could price the shoes at a thousand, and you still get a good bargain because these shoes are worth a uh, thousand, a thousand five hundred easily. When you start out, no one knows you. Not many people care about you. You have your personal network. You can tell a friend, hey, I'm starting this awesome shoe brand. Can I make a pair of shoes for you? And then he wears it, and then he likes it, and then if you're if you're lucky, then he tells a friend, and then he tries to convince that friend, come on, give him back, give these guys a shot. Um, for us, so in terms of marketing, uh, the connection we got from Cam happened organically. So we were selling our shoes on Spring, Shop Spring. Does anyone know Spring shopping app? And he was at one of our clients there, so we didn't even notice that. And then um, one day I saw it on social media, I saw like a huge jump in followers, like four, five hundred. And it was because he tagged us, because he loved the shoes, because he, he saw the craftsmanship, he, he actually acknowledged the, the quality and the time and effort that goes into it, he tagged us. So we then reached out and said, hey Cam, thank you so much for the love, we really appreciate it, we love who you are, what you represent. And it's also important to not just say, oh my god, thank you so much for the feature, love it, great. So they actually build the connection. So look at the other person, what the person is about. The Cam Chancellor, for instance, he's involved in a charity, he does a lot of projects, he, he cares a lot, he's a very mindful person, and by showing that you also care about that person, not on the level of that uh, whole uh, celebrity uh, being a sports star, but actually but what he really cares about, you give a lot of acknowledgement, and then the person is willing to give back. So it took us about, I would say, half a year to develop that relationship, but now it's been paying off immensely. So we got a lot of PR, a lot of press, and that's what we've been doing with every single client. So we treat every single client as if he was a superstar. I developed relationships with CEOs, and I was still an intern. I was shitting myself, excuse my French, but I was like, oh my god, I can't ask this person that. I'm just an intern. But they were super nice, and they loved the product. So I was like, yeah, sure, I'll, I'll give you five more guys, and they wrote an email, an introduction to other guys. And that's how we grew organically, more and more and more. We're still doing that to a certain extent. Of course, now I can't call every single customer and ask them about it. But I still, from time to time, I call the good customers. And they, they help you. Voluntarily, they will help you and just ask for it. I know it's, it's scary to ask for help because you think, <laughs> oh my god, I don't have anything to offer. But successful people, by nature, they love, most of them, they love sharing. They love giving back.